I didn't have I didn't pick anybody to read this morning, so I'm just going to read this here. Exodus chapter three. I think I'll just read to verse 6 here. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Father, we thank you for your word. I pray you bless it now. Bless the message. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> Title of the message this morning is God's Methods of Communication. God's Methods of Communication. <clears throat> Moses was about 40 years old. We're, we're following the life of Moses here in this little series on Sunday mornings. and He's about 40 years old when he left Egypt. Okay, We don't know all the details. We do have a story in Hebrews 11 is told, some details that we don't necessarily read in Exodus. And then we also have some details given in Acts chapter 7 where Stephen is getting stoned. And I mean, when he gets stoned, before that he's preaching the message and, and, and preach, basically gives the whole Bible in a nutshell, uh, I remember one time in my early days of soul winning, I was a Bible student, and uh, uh, well, let's say I guess I had gone soul winning before, but I was at Heartland, and I wasn't super experienced. I'd been soul winning a few times, but uh, but I remember I went out with a guy and and uh, knocked on a door, and I had the opportunity to share the gospel, and I started in Genesis with Adam and Eve, and I just kept going, and going, and going, and years later, the guy that was my soul winning partner there was like. And I still have never met anybody who preached the gospel and he started in Genesis and preached the whole Bible. <laughs> he says, you must have bored that guy out of, out of his mind. <laughs> okay, but, uh, but hey, that's what Stephen did. He preached the whole Bible, <laughs> the whole Old Testament. Uh, but anyway, I've got a lot more concise uh, uh, method now. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so we know this from these, putting these stories together. Acts chapter 7, verse 23, and... Verse 30 says he was 40 years old when he left Egypt. And then a 40, about 40 years later, he's on the backside of the desert, about 40 years later when about, you know, probably 40 years, when we see this uh, story right here where he sees the burning bush. So 80 years old. And then now we know he's going to spend another 40 years because he lives 120 years total. And so he spends another 40 years leading the children of, of uh, Israel out of Egypt and, and wandering through the wilderness and all that kind of stuff. So for 80 years, here's a guy who uh, the Bible says, you know, knew that his people, you know, even though he was in Egypt being raised by Pharaoh's daughter, he knew uh, that his people were the ones that were in being enslaved, and, and he knew that there was people, and eventually he leaves his, uh, Egypt, and he goes to be with his people, and knows that he's supposed to lead them out, and all that, but he's 80 years old, and now this is a strange way for God to communicate. I mean, would we all, would we all agree? I mean, here he's, according to our text, he's on the backside of the desert, okay, and uh, so the middle of nowhere, and he ends up coming to what's later, I guess, known as the mountain of God in Horeb here, which is also another uh, word for uh, what becomes uh, known as uh, Sinai. Okay, so he's in this mountain, which becomes this holy place where God speaks to him and everything. But when he first is there, he's just leading these sheep, and it's like no, he's not really, uh, you know, realizing that he's going to talk to God there. And he sees this bush that's burning, and he's like, that's a weird, weird sight. Like, I don't know if, if bushes 
caught on fire a lot in the desert? Maybe they did. I mean, I remember, I mean, around here when it gets real dry and it's real hot, there's a lot of grass fires that start. There are some that just start uh, because of the heat, I suppose. I would still expect, suspect that this is probably an odd view for him to see this bush burning. But even odder was the fact that it looks like it's continuing to burn and the actual bush isn't burning. There's just this fire that's going. So he steps closer to see that. And then the Bible says in our text there that an angel speaks to him from the midst of the bush. And then you read a little bit farther, and it says, uh, verse 3 says the angel talked to him, and verse, by verse 4 it says God talked to him. Okay, so God would use different messengers to, give his, his, uh, uh, to, to communicate his message, and uh, he would speak through these, a- through these angels. These angels would carry his message or whatever. And so a lot of times when an angel's talking, it just says God speaks, you know. Or if you want to get more... Um, deeper into that, you know, the angel of the Lord could be what's called a Christophany. So it could be that actually pre-incarnate Christ is actually communicating the message, Christ being the word of God from the, you know, f- from all eternity. And, uh, and so that's a possibility, but it's a weird thing. If you think about it, 80 years, and we would, it would appear in our Bible reading that God hasn't spoken to Moses and all of a sudden speaks to him in this bizarre fashion, speaking through the burning of the, uh, of the bush. Now, throughout our Christian lives, we have probably had God or felt like God was communicating us in various ways. Uh, I know whenever I was a kid, young Christian, uh, not really knowing much about the Bible or knowing much about how God works or whatever, I remember seeking answers from God. Haven't we all done that? And we all wanted God to drop the proverbial message in our lap, you know, this note come down from heaven or whatever. And I would do that. So I would, try to, uh, I would try to get an answer from God on things. And it was almost like the mindset of having the, you remember the eight ball that you shook and you said, you know, should I go there? And you look and it says, no, you shouldn't. Oh, man, let me try again. Should I go there? And, and you keep shaking it until it says yes. <laughs> I would do things like that with God. You know, I wasn't superstitious, but I believed that God would answer me. And so I would, I would do some random things like that. And, and basically, I think of it as kind of like casting lots. I read in Acts chapter 1, wherever uh, they're trying to elect another person to replace Judas. And, uh, and they, they cast lots. I don't know what that means. Some people say it's a, it's a type of rolling of the dice. Or some people say it's like drawing, drawing the short stick or, or whatever manner that they did. And the Bible doesn't say if they were right or wrong for doing it. But it seems really strange that that would be just like, let me just test God. And you know, like, whatever this lands on, you know, then that's, that's what we're going to do. But that's how they did it. And as a kid, I remember thinking, like, I'm just going to leave it in God's hands. Let him speak to me that way. Or something would just happen in my life. Some random circumstance would happen, and I'd be like, hey, that's God communicating with me. Anybody ever feel that? Like God's just communicating with them? Something happened? Uh, you know, I always interpreted that verse about uh, careful that you entertain, uh, uh, let's see, strangers, because you might be entertaining uh, angels unaware. I totally butchered that, but you know what I'm talking about. And I used to think, like, well, how do I know that this person I'm talking to isn't a messenger from God, you know? So, and, uh, and I just had a lot of thoughts like that in my life. Um, I don't necessarily look for those things anymore, but often when I'm talking to somebody, they'll say, I know God spoke to me. He gave me this vision, or he, you know, I heard, sometimes people even say, I heard this audible voice or something like that. And uh, you want to call them a liar or say, no, he didn't do that. Prove it, you know, or something. But I'm not going to do that to somebody who's, <laughs> who's uh, got it in their mind that God's speaking to them in, the, in one way or another. But Moses, it would appear almost as though nobody had, he had not heard from God in 80 years. And then all of a sudden, God speaks to him through this, this burning bush. That seems really bizarre. It seems like a strange way for God to communicate. But it isn't like, to be honest, that God... You know, had it, it's not like God talked to Moses, ha, had not talked to Moses all this time, and then all of a sudden he communicates with him this way. Now, I don't know how he talked to him exactly, but there are some ways that Moses apparently had communication with the Lord. Look at Hebrews chapter 11. Keep it placed in Exodus chapter 3, but go to Hebrews 11.
and look at verse, starting in verse 25, Hebrews 11, verse 25, or verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he had come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasure in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured uh, as seeing him who is invisible. Okay, so he's seeing him who's invisible. He's, he, he, he obviously has some kind of understanding, some kind of knowledge that God's leading him here or there, or he's leading him. You know, there was something inside him that caused him to, to decide now is time to leave the people here in, in, in Egypt and go after my people. Now it's time to forsake the pleasures of this kingdom and go to be with my people who are in slavery and all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, circumstances lead him away to the backside of the desert. Something, you know, in his heart says, hey, look over there at that bush. And he goes and sees the bush, and then he walks towards the bush, and then God communicates with him. I'm of the mindset that God is always communicating and has always been communicating since the foundations of the world. Now, some people will say, you know, well, God didn't talk for this much time in history, like uh, they talk about the Dark Ages, or how about this, the intertestamental period. So you got the end of Malachi, and then you go straight into Matthew chapter 1. There's about a 400-year gap in between there. So some people call that the silent period. They say, well, God's not communicating during that 400 years. I'm like, yes, he's communicating. Like, I'm getting ahead of myself. But one way, he, one way in which he's communicating is they had the Old Testament. <laughs> okay, so by the time you get to Matthew, you see that people are like waiting for the Messiah. And they've been reading God's word. And he's been communicating that, hey, this Messiah is going to come. And the wise men that come say, well, yeah, he's supposed to come from, uh, you know, he's supposed to be in Bethlehem. And, there, you know, there's this understanding where God's communicating. He's just not giving the revelation, you know, there's no burning bushes. There's no, you know, uh, there's no writing from the prophets that we have recorded there. But God's co methods of communication is an interesting uh, subject. I want to give a couple points on this. Basically, it comes down to two points, and this is basically theology 101. Okay, I didn't intend for it to be. I'm not a systematic theology type of a guy. Uh, yes, I went to Bible college. I went to two Bible colleges. Makes me smart, right? I didn't graduate either one. I just uh, kind of like stayed there a couple years and then started working in the church. I said, ah, college isn't for me. Went to the other college, started working in the church, said, ah, college isn't for me. Uh, it sounds good to say I was in college for 12 years, but the reality is I didn't even finish a four-year course, <laughs> okay? <laughs> but I do know this. Theology 101 says that there was two types of revelation, revelation, revelation where God speaks to us, okay? Number one is natural revelation. Number two is supernatural revelation, okay? So this is the two points. Number one, God communicates to us through natural revelation in God's creation, Look at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And look at verse 20. Now let's read verse 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things which are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. In one way or another, God's been communicating since the beginning of time to the point that if somebody goes to hell because they re didn't receive Christ, they can't turn that on God and say, well, it's not fair. You never sent anybody to me. One way or another, since the beginning of time, God's been communicating. And if, it, and if somebody felt short of communicating that me God's message to other people, then, it was, uh, you know, then the only thing that they had was what we would call natural revelation, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. And that's not enough necessarily to lead somebody to Christ, uh, but it is enough for people to look around and say, you know, there are some signs in this world and some evidence 
that is just natural within me and natural in the world that lead me to the knowledge and the understanding that there's a creator. And now I want to seek who that creator is. And I'm telling you, if you seek the Lord, he's going, you're going to find him. Okay? If you draw nigh to God, he's going to draw nigh to you. He's going to show himself. He's going to make himself known to you if you're seeking him out. And so anybody who's, who has just rejected religion or rejected Christ or rejected you know, any, anything, anything uh, reject God's word, obviously, then, you know, they are without excuse in the end because God has manifested uh, himself to them. Now, look at Deuteronomy 4. If all we have is natural revelation, if all we have is just what we see in nature, that could actually lead to uh, a bad spot. And in fact, I didn't read the rest of Romans 1 there, but we see that they begin to uh, worship and serve the creature more than the creator. Okay, look at Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4, starting in verse 16. <clears throat> Lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image. Okay, this is one of the first commandments God made. The, simil the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any beast that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged fowl that flieth in the air, the likeness of anything that creepeth on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the waters beneath the earth, and lest thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou see the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. And so if all we had as we look around are the things of this world, we would say, this is an amazing universe. And, it, and how could, you know, all these things have just gotten here by accident? And something within us would say, man, this is amazing. And so the next course of action would be, you know what? I mean, I'm, I'm just saying this is what, through, what history has taught us. The next course of action would be like, you know, maybe that sun is God. And people will start worshiping the sun. You know, or maybe, you know, the serpents are, I mean, you look at like Hinduism and everything is just like serpents. I mean, you know, someone's got serpents all over in their head and they're just like, there's, there's this great giant serpent uh, god that they talk about. I think that's Hinduism. And so there's this idea that they just looked around and they said, and of course there's a lot we can say about that, people worshiping uh, serpents, but <clears throat> they looked around in nature and said, hey, Maybe that's God. And then they began to make images and uh, people and, and uh, gods with big giant fat bellies or gods with lots of arms or whatever. <laughs> and they began to create these and say, these are our gods. Okay. And this all obviously made God uh, very upset because they, they went after all these things. Now, he was patient. He was patient. In fact, uh, when Paul's preaching to Athens, I'm going to talk about that a little bit tonight. He's preaching to those people in Athens, and he and he's talking about their um, their uh, you know going after different idols and all that kind of stuff. And he says this. He says, you know, once God winked at, but now He com commands all men to repent. Okay. In other words, you need to set aside those idols, turn from those idols, and turn to the Lord. Right and not and not worship those idols. It makes it very clear in that context that that's what they're repenting of is the is is believing in those idols and repent and turn to the Lord. But he's like you know he God's been very very patient and very long suffering as people try to figure out who God is and he accepted for a certain amount of time that in their ignorance they're doing all these things. He didn't just like send down. I mean he was even patient in the days of Noah. 120 years where the world was just wicked beyond imagination. I mean, we're slightly starting to imagine what it might have been like as we look around our world today. <laughs> but no, not even close. Okay, it was really bad. So where God destroyed the world, but he said, I'm going to wait 120 years. And so uh, the gospel continued to be preached during that time. He said, what do you mean the gospel? Well, read the New Testament. It talks about the gospel being preached in the time of Noah. <laughs> and so, uh, so God was... is. is uh, communicating and wants people to know the truth, but he communicates in bizarre ways sometimes. But anyway, not only, uh, we're talking about special, I mean, natural revelation, not only as we look at the world around us, but there's also something natural within us. It's funny what the Bible says, when the Bible says, does not even nature itself teach you, okay? All right, so the context of that verse is he says that it's, 
that it's a, on a woman, a long hair is her glory, right? But it's a shame on a, on a man. And a woman with short hair, it's a shame because her hair hairs are glory. That's what that context is saying. And he says, doth not nature itself teach you? Now, I've heard people say, nature doesn't teach that. Because if you look all around, you see like the male lion has long hair and the female lion doesn't have it. Those, they'll use all these different things. And he's, that's not what he's talking about nature teaches. What he's saying is it's naturally within you. You know, it's natural for a woman to desire the long hair and, to, and that to be her glory and all that kind of stuff. And it's naturally a shame, shame that a man would have long hair. Now you say, well, I don't see anything wrong with it. And you point to different, you know, like Samson. Samson had long hair. Yeah, it was a shame. That was part of the Nazarite vow. And you say, uh, you know, well, I don't see anything wrong with it. Our culture has accepted it and all that kind of stuff. Well, you can teach somebody that something's normal and they can begin to accept it, but that doesn't mean that it's naturally within them, okay? It's now unnatural, but they've, they've learned to accept that as the norm. Does that make sense? Because in our society, there's a lot of things that we've accepted as the norm that didn't come to us naturally. Somebody had to teach us that. But naturally, we would have saw it this way, okay? I'm getting a little bit off track, but God said that there are things that are within us that are natural. And one of the things that's natural within us is a conscience. You know that? It's naturally within us when we do something wrong. I mean, no one had to teach us that, hey, God's watching, and if you do something bad, then, then God's going to punish you or something like that. There's just this something natural that says, I shouldn't have done that. And like, uh, try, I'm all right. I use Viviana as an illustration. Okay. One day she'll, she won't be happy about it, but right now she doesn't know. <laughs> okay. Nobody had to teach her to like hide things, right? She just knows you know, what she's doing is, is wrong. Now, I understand she learned that because, like, we had told her no, we take things away from her, whatever. But she knows, like, uh, there's something that she's not supposed to be getting into, and if mom and dad catch me, they're going to take it away from me, and there's something in her that, that, that determines what's right and what's wrong. I know that we influence that, but I'm just saying. There's understanding, so how can I do I'm going to hide that, and I'm going to put it, and when she's caught, it's just like, you know, just throw it away or something like that. You know what I mean? We don't have to teach people that there's something natural within us that has a conscience. And human nature decides that, hey, we're going to go ahead and do what's wrong even though we're not supposed to, and we're going to try to conceal that and try to hide that. Look, Genesis 1, I mean, it's I mean, Genesis 1, but Genesis 3, it starts right away, right? They try to conceal what they've done, and then Cain you know, kills Abel and tries to hide that. And, oh, am I my brother's keeper? Like, and, and, and there's lies and deceit. That's been the ploy of Satan from the very beginning. But there's something within us. There's a, an awareness of right and wrong. There's an awareness of the, our existence, even. I mean, isn't that, I, I mean, I'm sure I'm not the only one that's ever just said it's so weird. As I look around, I can't feel what any of you guys are feeling. I can just look at you and know that you exist. But I can feel myself. I, can, I know that I'm here. I know what hurts, and I know what, <laughs> you know. It's just so weird to have that conscious, uh, this, that, that conscious you know, awareness of, of, of yourself. God put that in, in you. Psalm 139, 14 says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And he, and he says, Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. It's like inside me, my soul just says, man, I know that this is the work of God. Marvelous are thy works, you know. Uh, the fact that, that I'm just fearfully and wonderfully made and, and how things work the way they do and, and how our body heals itself. I mean, there's so many different systems that we could talk about in the body that says, man, God is, is amazing in our, and he's made our bodies uh, in an amazing way. <clears throat> But none of this tells us exactly who the creator is. It just tells us that there's a creator. None of this te tells us exactly what's right and wrong. There's just something in us that says, you know, I feel like this is wrong. Or I'm going to get in trouble if I do this. And there's a, some, some kind of sense and awareness of, of morals. So now let's talk about special revelation. Now somehow Moses... You know, Moses is attributed of writing Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, right? That's, that's called the, the books of Moses, right? Now, obviously, Moses wasn't around during the time of Adam and Eve, 
but somehow he, something was passed down to him. Sometime, somehow he was aware of all these stories, okay? And somehow he knew that Adam and Eve talked to God in the garden. How he talked to them, I don't know. Look at Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Don't let the sound of babies distract you. It's a beautiful sound. Babies in the church. I wouldn't go as far as one church. One church said, you know, people always ask about uh, why, they, why they let the babies in the service when they're crying and all that stuff. And they said, well, simple. We love them more than you. <laughs> I won't go that far, but. So Genesis chapter 3, verse 3 but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Somehow Moses knew that Eve had received this instruction. Well, I guess Eve probably received it from her husband. Maybe Adam received it uh, firsthand from God. I don't know. But Moses somehow knew this. Chapter 6. Verse 13. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through, through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. How did Noah hear from God? I have no idea. But it was a special form of revelation where God literally spoke to Noah. Maybe an angel, uh, maybe a burning bush, I don't know. Uh, somehow he spoke to him with this special type of revelation. In chapter 12... It says that God had told Abraham or Abram to get, uh, get thee from thy, thy country. And so we see that Moses knew that all these people had heard from God in some way or another. Even, in, uh, even uh, a King Abimelech in chapter 20, we see that he has a dream. And in his dream, God speaks to him. You follow that story on. Of course, you get to, uh, you know, Jacob and, and then Joseph and all these people are having dreams and these special revelations. Some of them are seeing angels uh, and, uh, and seeing God face to face, uh, which again could be just talking about a pre-incarnate Christ or something. But, uh, but the idea is that God is speaking to them in all these various forms. 1 Kings chapter 19. I want you to look at this one. 1 Kings chapter 19. I'm talking about God's f methods of communication. 1 Kings 19, sorry if you're not there yet, I'm, for the sake of time I'm just going to start reading it, but 1 Kings 19 starting at verse 11, <clears throat> this is God speaking to, uh, um, I'm sorry, this is, uh, this is Elijah speaking to a servant and he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord and behold the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind rent the mountains. And break in pieces the rock before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire a still small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in a mantle. And went out and stood in the entering of the cave. And behold there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? What a great picture. Uh, you know, again, this is special revelation. It happened to Elijah. It didn't happen to me. But all these great things come. This great whirlwind comes. And God's like looking, waiting for God to, to, to say something. Yeah, God's not in the whirlwind. Then this big earthquake comes. God's not in the earthquake. A fire, huge fire comes. Now, God was in the fire in Moses' time, but <laughs> this time, Elijah, it's not God. And then there's a still small voice, and that's God speaking. Now, some of us could say, well, I've heard that still small voice within me or, or whatever. Uh, look, I, I can't say. I can't say how God moves somebody, how God works in somebody. Look, I'm going to get to the Bible in a minute. I know you're waiting for it, okay? <clears throat> Real quickly, though, let me see. Okay. <laughs> that doesn't mean anything. That's just something that I do to put you at ease. <laughs> okay. One day, one day, we were going, we were getting ready to go on a trip, a camping trip. Right? And I don't remember the situation. We hadn't been here that long. Um, I'm without the, the job that I once had. So 
we're tight on money, uh, things are, 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 are kind of tough. And I remember this, I'm driving out somewhere and I'm sitting in a parking lot, I think I was waiting on my wife or, or something and, and uh, maybe she ran into the store, I can't remember, all I know is these birds came and it was, this is kind of weird, all right, I'm just telling you, I'm telling on myself, but this is kind of weird. I was like, God, I just feel like I need, to, I need to know your presence. I need you to speak to me. And I was like, can you send like one of those birds over to the car? Just, just do something like miraculous like that and send them so that I could see it. And I waited, waited, waited. Nothing happened. And then I kind of chuckled to myself. And I was like, that's silly to kind of ask God to do that. God gave us his word and he spoke to us through his word. And it kind of like re- instilled me like, hey, I'm needing to hear from God. I'm re- needing to hear from God. It's like, well, go get in the book, <laughs> open up the Bible and hear from God, you know. But I was like, but yeah, but I wanted that extra something or whatever. Anyway, time passed. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm serving the Lord. Things are going all right. And then we went on this camping trip, which I started the story out with. And then the camping trip, I get ready to go in the car. And uh, some of you might have heard the story before, but uh, it's, it's crazy to me. And this bird flew on the, I opened up the door and this bird flew up on the door and it looked at me. And I remember, like, that's hilarious. I remember, I remember that time when I said, God, send one of the birds over here. And I was like, all right, God, you're good. I mean, that's, that's funny. And I said, and the bird just wasn't moving. And I said, here, little bird. I put my finger up, and I kid you not, the bird jumped on my finger. And my kids couldn't witness this. They were nearby, and I was like, look at this. This bird is on my finger. I'm like Cinderella or something. <laughs> and they're like, uh, not Cinderella. What would be the man, man version of Cinderella? <laughs> and I felt like, in a way, God did that to me just to kind of, like, just show me, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm there, right? But, you know, but that could mean anything. And that could have happened to anybody. Maybe it was somebody's pet bird and it was trained or something. Who, who knows? Who knows? But it, it meant something to me, right? But God has given us something that's a special revelation, Right, that is something that's concrete, and it, you know, these people have their story about how God spoke to them this way. This person had God speak to them this way. There's something that we can all say God has spoken to us, and now it's complete. The message is complete, and that's in the Bible. <clears throat> Look at Second uh, Peter chapter one, and I'm wrapping up here. 2 Peter chapter 1. <clears throat> Second Peter chapter 1 verse 20 says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake, as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Keep your place there. God spoke to men like Moses and other prophets and in the New Testament to the apostles. And God spoke to these people in a special way and, uh, and inspired them. 2 Timothy 3.15 talks about that. Uh, they're given by inspiration of the Holy Ghost. And God inspired those men to write these down so that we would have them for generations and generations to come to be able to look back on and say, well, this is the mind of God. Now, look, there's a lot of people that are going to cast doubt on that. How do you know you have the right interpretation? What about these modern versions? You know, people are going to cast a lot of doubt on, wow, some man wrote this. And I could preach a whole message and give you arguments as to how, you know, the Bible, the the history of the Bible, even how it came to be and how the manuscript uh, evidence and all that stuff. We we could preach a whole message and try to prove to you that this is not just some book that some man sat down and wrote. This is a special book. This is very important. But none of that, none of that really matters if you don't have faith. You have to have faith. Now, interesting, God talks to people in the Bible that have faith. He doesn't talk to them so that they'll have faith. He talks to them because they, because they have faith. Even when God revealed himself, when Jesus revealed himself after he rose from the dead, 1 Corinthians 15, he says that he went and he revealed himself to people. And you start seeing this and you're like, wait a minute, these are the apostles. And then, you know, he saw the other brethren. And then it says, and all these people who are witnesses unto this day. And it's implying that he showed himself to believers. 
And look, I can see the scoffer and, and, the, and the mocker say, well, of course, you know, they're saying that because they're, they're the Christians. And so they're saying, yeah, he showed himself to me, right? But, the, but I don't look at it that way because I know God has spoken to me. And here's the thing. If you have faith, God begins to reveal himself to you. And God gave this Bible to those who have faith so that they would read it and say, you know, I've never seen God raise somebody from the dead. But when I read it, it's like I'm seeing him raise somebody from the dead because he did it in history. I never seen a burning bush that didn't catch on fire, but I, I see it here. I never heard a donkey talk. I had a bird on my finger, whoopee, okay? I want to see a donkey talk. He does. All you got to do is read your Bible. <laughs> you know? And all these things that happen, and people are like, well, where is he today? He's right here. This is the word of God. And we can pick it up and we can have confidence that it's true. Look at, uh, you were in for 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, look at verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in the dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. He's like, you know, we can look at God's word and be more sure about this prophecy right here than some dream that we had and say, well, God's talking to me through this dream. Well, not if it contradicts what's in here. The Bible says if even a man comes to you, even an angel himself comes to you and preaches another gospel, let him be accursed. The one guy that wrote that, Paul said, even if I come to you and preach another gospel, let him be accursed. What's written down here and what's recorded, that's the truth. And again, if a, a scoffer or a mocker can say, well, I don't believe it. Well, that's fine, but I do. <laughs> and because I believe it, God speaks to me all the time through his word. But I've got to get in it. Someone says, I'm not hearing from God. What are you waiting for, like a vision or something like that? You're waiting for a burning bush? He gave it to you. <laughs> you know, I'm not hearing from God. He's not going to drop a note down from heaven. I mean, he already did that. It's here. You can go to the dollar store and buy this thing for a dollar. Not this thing. <laughs> you, should go, you can get Bibles, you know, and go ahead and get a King James. Right? You can get Bibles anywhere. In fact, I've got a bunch of them here. I'll give them to you. I'll give you one. <laughs> Oh, one apiece, okay? Who wants a Bible? You know, we have Bibles and uh, multiple Bibles in every room of our house, it seems like sometimes. All you got to do to hear from God is open up the Bible. It's the Word of God, and He's given it to you. It's a special revelation. We do believe that God has spoken through all the things that we see in the Bible. He spoke to this guy in a dream. He spoke to this, this angel visited him. He spoke to this, uh, uh, you know, Moses through this burning bush. That was his method of communication. Now, I wouldn't argue with somebody who said, God, you know, God gave me this, this message through some kind of weird means. Uh, just real quickly, another story I've shared before. Look, I closed my Bible. I'm, we're getting closer. <coughs> this other message, uh, I mean, other illustration I've shared before that, uh, is always going to be on my mind is the day God called me to come to Iola Baptist Temple. Brother Collins had asked me to pray about coming down and, uh, and being just an assistant to him. I didn't actually have a position of, I joked about this in a message here recently, but it's not really, I didn't come down to have some position of authority. I just came to be a help and to work under his authority. Under his authority. And uh, anyway, he asked me to pray about that and consider and my first thought was, no, number one, I'm just working for your father-in-law. I mean, that's, that can't be a good idea. And number two, like, I, well, things are going pretty good where I am and the business and Valerie's teaching at the school and all these kind of things. I just kept thinking about all these things. And, uh, and, but I was like, but I'll pray about it. I'll pray about it. And God allowed, uh, it was weird because I had a cleaning business, but, and I was super busy. But for some reason, I took on this little job at the college, uh, the Bible college, uh, working in a, at a guard shack. They had some construction going on. They just needed somebody to watch the guard shack. So I thought, I'll, I'll do it, helping out my, my brother-in-law uh, who was running that. And so I sat in that guard shack, and I would put the radio on, right? It was back before uh, Internet was so accessible and all that stuff. I know I'm old. Uh, it was accessible. I just didn't have it. And, uh, and so I just had the radio on. And I actually don't typically, like, recommend everybody just listen to talk radio and, and all that. Not Some people aren't ready to to hear some of the different teachings that are out there, a lot of false doctrine and stuff like that. But, but I had it on nonetheless, and I had uh, uh, Charles Stanley was, was preaching. I can't, no, no, I think it was Chuck Swindoll, one of those two guys that are on the radio a lot. 
And uh, I'll never forget this. I was just sitting there, and I had it in the background just going. And I was waiting. There was no car, no vehicles coming or anything. So I was like praying about this and thinking about the, uh, the will of God coming here. And I, and I put this piece of paper, and I, and I made a, a little thing here, pros and cons. And I put pros and cons. And, you know, I was going to go through the ordeal listing the pros and cons. And as soon as I finished writing the word cons, the preacher on the radio said, some of y'all need to stop making your pros and cons list and just do what God told you to do. And I was like, okay, God. <laughs> now, look, I'm not saying it's going to happen to you. I'm not even saying 100% that that was God speaking to me. I know that it was his will to come and I came and all that stuff. But that's something that you're not necessarily going to find in the Bible. People can say, like, well, God led me to do this. God, you know, put it on my heart to give this or to go there or to do that. And praise the Lord. I'm not going to argue with anybody. But on the essential things that God wants us to know, the general things in our life that we need to know about, he's given it to us. And it's concrete. It's solid. It's not going anywhere. No one's adding to it or taking away from it. I mean, I know that some of the translators and uh, have messed up some things there, but for the most part, it's all the, all the evidence is out there, and, uh, and, and it's, all, it's all there. <clears throat> Let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you so much for your word, and I thank you for how you've communicated since the beginning of time to your creation. And I pray, Lord, that you'll help us not to take lightly that we've got your, uh, your finished and completed revelation in our hands and that we can read it at any time. Help us never make the excuse that uh, we're not hearing from you or we're so distant, f distant from you because you're speaking to us. And I thank you for the Holy Ghost, Lord, that if we're saved and we've trusted in Christ and, uh, and you've given us the Holy Spirit within us, it can guide us and direct us and lead us to your word and, uh, and, and confirm in our hearts when, when, uh, when something's right or wrong. Uh, I thank you for communicating with us in that way. And even when we don't know how to communicate with you, Lord, the, the Holy Spirit gives us utterance and, and, uh, and we're able to communicate with you uh, in, a, in a supernatural way we don't even understand. And I pray, Lord, that you will just continue to guide and direct in this church and guide us individually as we seek your will and want to know uh, what, you, what you would have for us. Help us not to, cert, to uh, seek the answers from ungodly counsel. Help us not seek other sources, Lord, but help us to seek your word first and foremost. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.